Raptor, your Falcon 9. Second Stage. The Air Force helped fund Raptor development for possible use on a Falcon 9 second stage. This would be a smaller Raptor to better fit the size needed for the Falcon 9. The Air Force put a, in a chunk of money, up to 61 million initially, and then more than 40 million a year later. Why was the Air Force interested in a different engine? That requires a bit of an explanation. This goes back to the Air Force, now Space Force, launch requirements. The Air Force was looking for new options to launch their satellites since they were fully dependent on ULA's Atlas V and Delta IV launchers. These launchers were very reliable, but they were also very expensive. To win part of the NSSL contract, you need to be able to hit all of these orbits. The top seven are relatively easy, but there are two at the bottom that are hard to get to. They are geostationary orbits that require the launcher to do a lot of work. Let's explore why. Here's a diagram that should help. The goal for a geostationary payload is to get out to about 36,000 kilometers and establish a circular orbit. This first diagram shows the launch, with the red part showing powered launch and the yellow part showing a long coast phase. This initial boost puts the payload into what is known as a geostationary transfer orbit. But there's a problem. Only the high part of the orbit, or apogee, is at the proper altitude. The lower part of the orbit, or perigee, is still close to the Earth. To get to the proper orbit, we need to have a circular orbit. This is done by thrusting at the apogee, and we can progressively change the orbit to one that is more circular, until we finally hit the circular orbit that we want. There may also be an adjustment to the orbital inclination at the same time. There are three basic ways to do this. The first is with hypergolic thrusters built into the payload. These thrusters put out quite a bit of thrust, so they can circularize the orbit in one to three burns. This was the most common way of doing circularization for a long time, although it does have relatively low ISP in the thrusters and therefore a lower payload capacity. The second way of doing this is to use ion thrusters, sometimes known as electric propulsion, on the payload. These thrusters put out very low thrust and therefore need to run continuously for months to circularize the orbit, but they have an ISP around 2000 or maybe higher, so that means smaller fuel tanks and therefore larger payload capacity or longer lifespan for the payload. They do require large solar panels to supply the electrical power, but big communication satellites already have large solar panels, so that works out well. Pretty much all of the new geostationary communication satellites use ion thrusters. The third way is to use the engines built into the second stage. Those are generally pretty big, so they can do everything in a single burn, but there are two downsides. The first is that both the payload and the second stage need to be circularized, and that reduces the payload significantly because of the extra weight. The second is that it takes a long time to get out there, five hours or more, and that means the second stage needs to last that long so that it can perform the burn. That's especially hard for a Falcon 9 because it needs to keep the RP-1 fuel warm for five hours to get to the burn point. That second problem is why the Air Force was interested in a different second stage engine. That's not why you came here, however. So let's move on to talking about putting a Raptor on the Falcon 9 second stage. The results of putting the Raptor on the first stage were less exciting than many had hoped. Will it be different this time? Let's see. Let's talk about the competition. The Merlin vacuum engine is a gas generator engine using RP-1, or refined kerosene, and liquid oxygen. This is known as Carolox. Going up against the Merlin is the Raptor, a full-flow staged combustion engine using liquid methane and liquid oxygen, or methalox. And just to have some fun, I decided to add in the venerable RS-25, or space shuttle main engine. It's a fuel-rich staged combustion engine using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. 
or hydrolox. Going through some parameters, the Merlin puts out 981 kilonewtons of thrust. The Raptor puts out around 2,000 kilonewtons. All these Raptor numbers are estimates. And the RS-25 puts out 2,280 kilonewtons. For ISP, the Merlin has a healthy 348, the Raptor 380, and the RS-25 wins with an ISP of 452. I couldn't find an exact weight for the Merlin vacuum, so I added about 50% to account for the added size and complexity of this engine and got 750 kilograms. The Raptor is probably around 2,000 kilograms, and the RS-25 is a hefty 3,177 kilograms. Finally, the nozzle size of the Merlin is 3.03 meters, which fits inside the 3.7 meter diameter of the Falcon 9. The Raptor is smaller at about 2.5 meters, and the RS-25 is still smaller at 2.4 meters. There's an interesting question here. Why do these big vacuum engines have such a smaller nozzle than the Merlin? Both the Raptor and the RS-25 have regenerative nozzles that are cooled by passing one of the propellants through them. But if you want to test them before launch, and you do, they need to have nozzles that are small enough to remain stable at sea level. And of course, the RS-25 had to function at liftoff for the shuttle. Most of the Merlin nozzle has no cooling channels, so it can be tested before most of the nozzle is attached. The Raptor also has to fit in the space provided in Starship. This larger nozzle is one of the, reason, the reasons the Merlin is so close in ISP to the Challengers. We'll start by seeing how our engine choices affect our propellant load. The Merlin burns RP-1, which has a density of 840 kilograms per cubic meter, and runs at a mixture ratio of 2.36 parts oxygen to one part RP-1 by mass. If we know the second stage holds about 100 cubic meters of propellant, that amounts to 63% liquid oxygen and 37% RP-1 by volume. The total amount of propellant is about 111,000 kilograms. Moving on to the Raptor, it burns liquid methane, which has a density of 445 kilograms per cubic meter, which is about half the density of RP-1. That would lead us to expect it to require about double the space for the liquid methane, but the mixture ratio is higher, more liquid oxygen, so when we do the math it turns out that the stage would be 56% LOX and 44% liquid methane. Removing some locks and replacing the RPM-1 with liquid methane reduces the mass of the propellant we can carry down to about 90,000 kilograms, or about 20% less. Finally, the RS-25 burns liquid hydrogen with a density of only 71 kilograms per cubic meter. It makes up for it a bit by having a high mixture ratio of 6.03 to 1, but even with that, we end up with a LOX tank that's only 25% the total volume, and the remaining 75% is needed for liquid hydrogen. That drastically reduces the amount of propellant we can carry, down to about 37,000 kilograms. The low density of liquid hydrogen is a big issue for designs that use it. Now we can look at the results we get from those stages with those engines. We'll be talking about Delta V, so I put a link up in the corner to another video. Here are the Merlin results. The Merlin has a low ISP, only about 348, but it crams a bunch of propellant into the stage, so that gives a high mass ratio. The ratio of the mass fully fueled to the mass empty. This gives a delta V of about 6,500 meters per second. The Raptor has a higher ISP of a 380, but a worse ratio because we could only put 80% of the propellant in the stage. So those sort of cancel out, and the delta V comes out at 6,260 meters per second. It's in the same ballpark as the Merlin, but a little bit less. The RS-25 has a great ISP, but it falls down on the mass ratio, and it, that essentially kills its performance only netting about 4,380 meters per second of delta V, a distant third to the other options. One of the other factors that affects performance is gravity losses. So I wanted to see if I could calculate gravity losses for each option, but I ran into another issue. This chart shows how fast each of these options burns their propellant. 
The Merlin vacuum launching a Starlink payload will burn for somewhere around 380 seconds. The Raptor is much more powerful and it has less pro propellant and it burns for about 155 seconds and the much lighter RS-25 version will only burn for about 70 seconds. The shorter burn times coupled with the higher thrust of these engines creates a problem. The Merlin starts off at a bit less than 1 G of acceleration and then ends up at a bit over 5 Gs if it's not throttled down. The Raptor starts at 2 Gs and rapidly increases, hitting nearly 11 Gs. And the RS-25 starts at 4 Gs and also trends up above 10 Gs. The engines can be throttled down a bit, but really not enough to fix the issue. And at lower thrust, their ISP will be reduced. It turns out there was a reason the Air Force wanted a smaller Raptor. Let's see what we can do. The Raptor is roughly twice the power we need, so I'm going to create a new engine. It's known as the Haftor, with a thrust of 1,000 kilonewtons, and it's only going to mass around 1,300 kilograms because it's smaller. The RS-25 is even more overpowered than the Raptor because the stage is so light, so we're going to need to go to one quarter scale. That will be the RS-6.25 with 570 kilonewtons of thrust and only 1300 kilograms of mass. How will these work? We can now rerun the delta V calculations as the engines are lighter. The haftor moves up 100 meters per second to 6,365 meters per second. The RS 6.25 moves up 250 meters per second to 4,630 meters per second. That's a pretty good gain for both of them, but still less than the Merlin. Now we can flip back and look at our graph of remaining propellant, and we can see that now both of the candidate motors run for a whole lot longer. The half door runs for 330 seconds, and the RS 6.25 runs for about 285 seconds. And that's much more reasonable. With the new acceleration graph, we can see the half door reaches about the same acceleration as the Merlin. It finishes a bit faster, so it's going to gain a little bit in gravity losses, which will put the Merlin and the half door closer together. The RS 6.25 follows a similar curve to the other engines but it kind of burns out a bit too early because of the amount of propellant. It's not really possible to give it both the higher thrust and the longer burn time because of the lack of propellant mass. Now that we've done our analysis, I think we can reach a few conclusions. The Haftar upper stage doesn't look like it has any real advantages over the Merlin, and the RS 6.25 lags far behind as it simply does not pack enough propellant to be competitive. So, why would you want to do the Haftor? Not so fast. As we noted earlier, both the Haftor and RS 6.25 end up being lighter than the Merlin simply because their propellant weighs less. That means the first stage can produce more delta V because it's lifting a lighter second stage. Skipping the math to get new numbers, we'll start with the second stage delta V for each of the options then we can add in the first stage. For a Starlink launch with the Merlin, the first stage gives 3,770 meters per second, and the full stack nets a total of 10,270 meters per second. Going with the half tour, the first stage goes up to 4,060 meters per second, and the full stack nets a total of 10,425 meters per second. That's 1.5% more than the Merlin, and there's probably a little bit more with the reduced gravity losses. The RS 6.25 puts, puts up a strong showing with a first stage of 5,190 meters per second and a total of 9,820 meters per second, only 4.4% less than the Merlin. The lightness of the second stage redeems it a bit, but it's still not competitive. So, now we can get to the real summary. So what did we learn? First, the Air Force was interested in the Raptor upper stage primarily to handle the long duration flights that go directly to geostationary orbit. 
In 2020, the Falcon 9 was certified to do those flights. So this is no longer an issue for the Air Force, or I guess the Space Force. Second, to use Raptor technology on the Falcon 9 would require a smaller engine, and it would only produce a few percentage points of performance gain. It's unlikely to be worth it financially, and that's why SpaceX is no longer working on it. Finally, the RS 6.25 is my favorite made up engine name. Thank you for your attention. Please subscribe.